You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Patrick Coleman. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you. Before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors today. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. She's got a team of eight people who help provide services to fiction authors. And she has a full slate of services that now include beta reading. She's got four beta readers now. So if you're looking for beta reading services, she can definitely take on your project. Manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors can also inquire about putting their books in her Book Lovers Box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. It's free to authors for a limited time. Be sure to check out Crystal and her whole team at Pico's House. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com. Thanks, Crystal, for sponsoring the show. While Cape and Spandex movies are breaking box office records, comic book commentator and influencer Ed Gosney doesn't want us to forget the roots of these marvelous wonders. His blog, Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com, covers the gamut of four-color entertainment from contemporary comic books to comics made for kids to bargain bin gold to classics that will transport you back in time. Comic books are a perfect blend of art and story, and Cool Comics captures the essence of what these funny books mean to us in a personal way. And make sure to join the Cool Comics in My Collection Facebook group where members can interact, show off their prized comics, and have opportunities to win, you guessed it, Cool Comics. Published weekly, Cool Comics in My Collection aims to bring you a smile and reminds us why comic books are fun. Be sure to visit edgosney.com today. Speaking of superheroes and comics, my friend Patricia Gillum has a fantastic series called The Heroes of Corvus. It begins with book one. A flight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the deaths of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city aren't out of danger. This is such a phenomenal story. Uh, She has released up to part four now, and I cannot wait for part five to come out. If you're looking for a great adventure read that's uh, on the cutting edge of what is in today's entertainment, The Heroes of Corvus is the series for you by Patricia Gillum. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com to subscribe to the show. We're on just about every platform you can imagine. Now stay tuned for our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Patrick Coleman uh, on the show with me today. He has a phenomenal new book. It is one of the most unique uh, noir uh, books that I've read in quite a while, uh, and it has a really uh, interesting personal connection with me, and we'll talk all about that uh, in a little bit, but... uh, Patrick, I love the book. I love what you're doing. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I know it's a, it's an audio medium, uh, so you can't see that I'm blushing uh, profusely <laughs> over here for all those nice things you just said about about this book. Uh, I, I love it, Patrick, and, and we're going to talk all about it in a minute. But before we do that, we open the show each time with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Gosh, it's a it's a good question, and it's it, it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Um, and this may be surprising for someone you know who who has a a, a crime novel um, as his first novel. But you know, the two things that come to mind, um, you know, I was, a, I was an early huge Shel Silverstein fan, and I mean, I treated that book, so I always had a lot of trouble sleeping. 
and and I I treated that book like it was is like a like a book of spells or it was a bible like I could take it to bed with me and it would help me get to sleep at night and I'm, so I remember kind of early on feeling like I gotta I can I can do this thing this magical thing that Shel Silverstein does and I really want to try um, and I think the other one which I've kind of been talking a little bit about now is uh, you know the thing that really turned me into a reader when I was a kid um, like a reader of novels was actually right when the Star Wars uh, early novelizations were coming out that expanded universe and my dad got me one of those and I was I was hooked that was the first time I really you know just took off as you know I, I mean it was a great time because there was just a, a new book coming out every six months um, and so this was in the days before the internet but there were things like Prodigy and CompuServe and there were these forums on there where people would do these storytelling based uh, role-playing games where you'd invent a, a character in the Star Wars universe. And um, and so I kind of fell neck deep into that world, you know, when I was, I don't know, nine or 10, 11 years old, just writing thousands and thousands of words uh, with this sort of, this completely bananas Star Wars fan fiction. Um, and that's where I really started to find, like, I really enjoyed telling stories through the written word. Um, which is a nice place to do it. You know, you've got, you got friends and it's, collaborative and uh, there's a good safe space for it love that um that th there's you know i i lament sometimes the the early days of the internet and even pre-internet uh some of the bulletin board systems and some of the bigger ones like you're talking about CompuServe and stuff there was a uh i don't know that the internet seems like it can be such a such a hateful place sometimes and and people are just flame warring all over the place and and i remember kind of a kinder gentler time and uh, i kind of miss that sometimes it's true although you know and, uh, and I, I completely agree i mean it's a garbage fire time to be alive <laughs> um but you know even you know we're talking like a couple days after the hugo awards um and this year so the archive of our own has been uh which is a, a sort of forum for fan fiction um has been getting all these awards and notice this year for kind of creating a space like that on the internet that is still, you know, creative and, and fan friendly and um, supportive and diverse and inclusive. So it's always nice. I mean, it's a little bit Mr. Rogersy to say, you know, look for the helpers, but even on the internet, there's still some, some nice pockets of good things. Right. Right. Well, you know, you and I can do our part to, to bring that back. And, and that's, you know, one thing about this podcast is we, we try to, you know, spread the, the good vibes of creativity and, and putting a little something good back into the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where did you grow up? Uh, so I was, I was born in Orange County, California, um, lived in all kinds of different small towns around there. Um, and then we moved down to Oceanside, which is the northernmost city in North San Diego County um, when I was six. And so grew up, grew up there um, in in this kind of beach town that's in the shadow of a large military base, Camp Pendleton. Um, and, uh, and that, I mean, as, as you see, it ended up being the setting for, for this book. Yeah. And, and it definitely kind of bleeds in to the story. Uh, the, you, you definitely have a love for this place and the, the, the little details and the, the little things uh, for someone who's not from California. Like I really appreciate those things. It makes me feel like, uh, I'm connected to this place that I know very little about. Well, thank you. Where Where are you at? I don't even I, know. Where yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, we're on the Gulf Coast uh, in the uh, Mississippi, down uh, right by the Gulf of Mexico. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. When When I got your book in the uh, in the mail, when the, our UPS driver dropped off our our daily load of arcs, um, I saw this cover and I was I was immediately intrigued. And when I kind of thumbed through it and I read the back cover, um, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I judged it a little bit. Um, I was like, oh, I, I, I think I know what the story is. And I've, um, you know, there's a – I'd love to hear. What, what was your impression? Well, I – let me see how I can how I can say this judiciously without um, just making everybody mad. Um, as as a kid who grew up in church um, and and had – you know, that experience growing up and, and then, you know, when grown, um, kind of finding your own faith path, let's, let's just say, uh, and, and looking back and seeing, 
um, kind of how how crazy some things are, and you know, um, the you know the whole subculture of that can be pretty weird. Um, and there are lots of folks who have who have done that and have um, kind of grown past that uh, those early influences of things, and then come out and just write kind of hateful things. Um, and um, uh, you know, and and whether. I don't know. There's a uh, there's an interesting thing that happens where your early influences you you tend to kind of defend them in a way. Um, I, I don't know. That, so so I kind of I wondered if if you were coming from a, a similar background and if um, if this is going to be one of those books where um, you know you just completely made fun of uh, of that experience and uh, and while that is definitely warranted in a lot of cases you know you, you just wonder um I, yeah. I did not get that from this book at all um you definitely kind of uh poke fun at sacred cows and and really explore you know what it means to to have faith to believe in something uh and then to have you know your uh the things that you believe in the, the rug pulled out from under you sometimes and then that forces you to to really figure out what you believe and not just what you've been taught um, and I, I love what you did with the book. I, I love the, the respect and, um, the ability to kind of poke fun all in the same thing. Well, that's really, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. It's, it was an important part of, I wouldn't say necessarily my first intention with writing the book, but as, as it evolved and as I was working on it, um, you know, it was, it was a really, it was part of the design of it. Um, as it took shape in my, in my mind that, um, that I wanted it to be a book that could be enjoyed, uh, by believers and non-believers, um, and that would have a critical edge that would be, you know, useful for believers and non-believers. And there's something kind of, a uh, crucible, like in a, in that sort of noir style story that, um, that can kind of work hopefully for, for everyone. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I similarly, I, I grew up, uh, I, in the early years of my family was Catholic, you know, fell in more with an evangelical, uh, community and church, uh, in my teenage years, the way a lot of people did, especially at that time, I think at any time, you know, they have better music and more girls. So you end up going there. Um, and then, uh, uh, so, so no, I mean, I've always thought that, that faith is just a really interesting question uh in an, in an interesting way of understanding the world um and uh and you know confession narratives and testimony and all those kind of first person style stories going all the way back to you know like augustine or you know the first person testimony of the, the gospels um you know just speaking about the christian faith in particular um and there's just so much interesting tension in those being first person stories you know this, this is what i saw this is how i saw it um, and there's always that, you know, level of reliability or unreliability in those kinds of narration um, that, I thought, you know, fit really perfectly with a kind of Raymond Chandlery detective story. Yeah. Well, and that's what I was going to say is the the uh, the vibe of this book that I get is like if Raymond Chandler were uh, a youth group kid in the 80s or 90s, this is the this is the book that would have come out. <laughs> I, I will accept that as a very good description of this. <laughs> it's amazing, amazing. Um, it, it, when you were growing up, did you did you know that you were going to uh, pursue uh, something creative? Uh, where did your family encourage that? Was uh, was creativity something that was fostered in your home? You know, um, so I would say that everyone in my family is creative in in different ways, but we're, everyone um, else is, is pretty uniformly more, more kind of uh, science minded, you know, I have a couple of dentists in the family, a, a financial advisor. Um, I, I, me and my younger sister are the, the more kind of classically creative ones. Um, so I think at times my family maybe didn't know what to do with, with that, but to their credit, I mean, they, they knew that I was, more I was wired differently and so they got me a piano early on and they encouraged writing and have been really supportive um even if uh having a a, a career in in the arts or pursuing art as a career was was pretty foreign 
Yeah. You you also have published a collection uh, of poetry. What what was your your first experience with with poetry that really um uh kind of uh, excited you about that? I mean, I'm finally left. We already kind of talked about Shel Silverstein, and I now I now have small kids, and we read Shel Silverstein and all kinds of other more recent great children's poetry. And I mean, I think that was an, an early one. Um, and then, you know, the way poetry gets taught, I think, in a lot of middle schools and high schools can can turn people off of poetry pretty much for good. I mean, I just got got lucky that. Um, when I when I got into college, you know, there's a, a couple really good uh, early teachers exposed me to more contemporary poetry that felt like it was speaking to the way we were moving through the world right now, and not the way people were a hundred years ago. Um, and um, and then especially working in a I, so after college, I worked in an independent bookstore, um, and that was that was the real place where you're just like your fellow booksellers and people coming in to buy books you know, they're, they're recommending things and new poets that, um, that you've never heard of and you can just pull them off the shelf and check them out. Um, so that it was a really like, that was how I kind of started to get exposed to more kinds of poetry and more kinds of books in general, you know, from detective fiction to more surrealist literary fiction and everything in between. Well, what I love is that, um, there's definitely a connection um, between uh, poetry, or, or there should be, and the kind of noir detective fiction that that is is not easily discernible on the surface. You know, um, uh, kind of this noir. Uh, the prose is tight. It's it tends to be punchy, and uh, I, you know, in in hindsight, looking back, you say, "Wow, this this would be a great medium uh, for someone who is well versed in poetry and who understands the economy of words." The uh, the the well placed phrase the 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 turn of phrase that can evoke more than just the words themselves are able to. Um, do you see a connection between poetry and the kind of prose that you write? And do you feel like um, your experience with poetry has made you a better prose writer? That's a that's a good point, a good question. Um, you know, I think I mean that's something that that Chandler really did for detective fiction, for pulp fiction. Um, and he's not the only one, but it was especially, you know, an early one who really um, took that the, the storytelling mode um, and really put a lot of pressure on the language um, and did something really unique and beautiful with it. Um, and then I feel like he kind of opened the door for a, a lot of the really great um, blurring of those boundaries between, you know, quote unquote high literary art and the quote unquote low popular um, arts. I think it's where a lot of the really great work has been done in the last hundred years of, of American and world literature across the board. Um, now with, with my experience with poetry and with writing a detective story, I think writing poetry helped, um, you know, in thinking about language and thinking about tone and, and about, you know, in a, with a poem, you think about the speaker of the poem, who is, you know, typically you don't necessarily identify that with the author, and you know how each utterance of that person makes tells you something about who they are, um, even if it's indirect or even if it's not what they wouldn't in, would intend for you to take away. So that all really informed what I wanted to do differently with uh, with a detective style noir. Um, which was kind of like a, a different poetics for a noir than like a Raymond Chandler. Um, and especially around letting Haynes talk a lot more, let him, letting him run his mouth more in the narration and sometimes in dialogue um, in, a, in part to, to get more of who he is and his backstory into the story proper. I, you know, in, in a lot of the, the Philip Marlowe novels, you know a little bit. Of, you have a, a, a sketch of his biography. You have a kind of he's sort of a walking attitude, though, more than anything. Uh, and and that was became a really important sort of driving force for me. Is you know no, you don't. Like, this is an interesting position to be telling a story from. And who is the kind of person who feels confident telling a story from this position? Who who can sort of see the world in these black and white terms and. Um, and feel like they're like the one person able to pursue the truth 
um, which to me sounded a lot like a pastor, um, you know, someone who kind of holds themselves apart from the culture at large and, and judges it and, and has a, a kind of clear eyed view that he doesn't, and he is usually a man, um, especially pastors are almost always men in more conservative evangelical churches. Um, and so part of, part of the, the sort of curiosity that kept me going was, well, how much of, how much of that personality can I get into this story? Um, make that one of the subjects of the story um, while still hopefully keeping it, you know, a, a really, you know, like a driving, you know, compelling mystery. So in, in, in the genre, we, uh, l- like you mentioned, we, we usually have uh, a protagonist who um, we know some about, but they, like you said, their, their biography is a little sketchy and, and we know they're kind of broken. They have some hangups and, uh, and we, you know, uncover things about them in the midst of the story. Um, Mark Haynes, as you mentioned, uh, is laid bare, uh, for us. He, he's a really interesting character in this genre. Um, the, uh, where did Mark first come to you? Did, did he just come out of this thinking that this, this sounds like this could be a pastor? And, and so Mark is kind of formed in that, or had this character been following you around for a while? You know, he, he he's someone that I, I really discovered in the process. I mean, he's, so there's parts of who he is that I've pulled from different places. Um, he's not autobiographical at all. Um, although, uh, you know, there's just, you know, there's some, some elements of me kind of drawn into it or certain ways of thinking that have you know, been pushed to extremes. Um, but, uh, but he really, you know, the first draft, I really did think, um, you know, I've been reading a lot of Georges Simenon, the French uh, sort of detective noir writer, um, and he would lock himself in his uh, in his room. I think take a lot of amphetamines, and then write a whole novel in like eight days. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to do amphetamines. Uh, I, I could write I could write one of these books in like a summer. Um, I thought, you know, this will be really fun, easy, a good way to kind of practice writing a novel. And at first draft, you know, most of Mark was not really there. The story doesn't really work, um, and it and it it didn't work as a book. But I, the some of those questions, you know, about you know who is the kind of person who feels confident like going on this kind of quest? Um, what what kind of unique things could I draw in about the aspects of California that I don't think get talked about very much? That it is actually a pretty conservative place, pretty religious place. Um, you know, I think I mean, you live in Mississippi, there's a certain stereotype about, you know, people from Mississippi. And there's stereotypes about Californians. And um, I feel like part of what writers like to do is complicate those assumptions. Um, and uh, and so he seemed like a really great vehicle for doing that. I mean, that's one of the things that when I first got turned on to, to noir um, and detective fiction that I loved is that a detective can move around society in this really uh, unique way and can move across social levels and poke his nose in places where we don't normally get to go. Um, and so there's a kind of sociological view that they get that is missing in a lot of, not all, but in a lot of more kind of domestic realist uh, literary fiction. Um, but I found that I also, I, like I wanted that, but I also really wanted to understand and think hard about you know, what takes, what gets a person to this spot um, and how through him we might, explore some interesting questions about faith and faithlessness and anger, um, and about, and about, about men and, um, and religion. Um, so that those, those kind of questions were at least for me, the ways of learning more about him and to keep me curious going through the draft um, that I went through to, to write the book. Well, we, we've talked kind of around Mark Haynes, uh, for a minute and, uh, but you know, you mentioned earlier that that this sounded like someone who could be a pastor, and and uh, but we haven't talked about uh, the reason Mark is not in that position anymore. What uh, what was the uh, the initial idea that brought you to um, Mark is is kind of at a disgraced place in his life when we when we start? It's a good question. I don't know if I can really parse where each piece of that came from. Um, but, you know, the, the long and short of it is that um, 
you know, he was a, a youth pastor of a, of a rising, what would become kind of a mega church. Um, and then his sister, who was also a, a fervent believer, commits suicide, um, which sets off this crisis of faith for him, uh, sets off a, a drinking problem, causes him to self-destruct his family, um, alienate himself from his his religious community that had been a, a huge part of his life. Um, and, uh, and so I, it's hard for me to kind of pin down exactly where all those parts came from, but they do, they did feel like, um, like this is one version of what happens to someone when, when trauma visits them and the religious framework that they have for understanding the world doesn't, isn't able to account for it, um, especially, you know, for certain strands of Christianity, um, you know, suicide is a, is a really big, uh, a big sin. Um, and people who commit suicide go to hell. Um, and, you know, we've seen some really big pastors have to wrestle with this very publicly, like Rick Warren of Saddleback uh, Church. Um, his son uh, struggled with mental uh, mental illness um, his whole life and, and sadly um, committed suicide. Uh, what was that? Maybe five years ago, maybe a little bit more now. I think so. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, so he obviously didn't implode his family and become a security guard like Mark Haynes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it is like, I think, a, you know, he, you've seen him change quite a bit um, uh, in response to having something like that happen. And, and so I was wanted to think about, you know, that is part of Mark's backstory, this trauma that sets off a very different worldview. Um, and then some of the ways that that worldview also can calcify um, just as much as, uh, you know, uh, the, the one that he was raised with was. Well, and um, you, what's interesting to me is Mark finds himself at this low place, completely cut off, alienated from everything and everyone that kind of made him who he believed he was. Um but you know, as as chance and and fate have a, a tendency to do, we are often um, presented with opportunities for redemption in very strange ways. Uh, and and Mark finds himself, uh, you know, uh, working through some of the stuff by by helping someone else, and then that all goes completely haywire. Um, how, did you love torturing uh, Mark the way you did in the book? Because it's so much fun to read. um i don't know i mean as a writer you do want to torture your characters in a certain sense right you know if if things are too easy on them then you don't have a story or you don't have a very dramatic or interesting story um although you know there are great books where it's a you know very happy you know kind of event-free situation uh nicholson baker's the mezzanine is one of my favorite books and it's just a, a very ruminative very you know actually very happy book um, and i kind of love it for that but for especially for kind of crime fiction um you, if you're not putting turning the screws on your characters then uh then it's probably not going to work so i don't know i so i did it very deliberately um i don't know if i loved it just because i mean in some ways I, it's funny it's, it, people are responding to mark in all kinds of different ways which is as i i love um, yeah, but Mark is, he's an asshole. He's, yeah. I don't know if, can I, can I curse <laughs> oh, on the absolutely. podcast? Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, so he's, he's an asshole. Um, you know, he's, as I, like I've been saying a lot, you know, he's he's not exactly wrong most of the time, but he's not exactly right either. And yeah, you definitely really question enjoy... his motivations. Yeah, yeah, and he's, I mean, he's a he's a screwed up dude. Um, and uh, And so that was, that was fun kind of figuring out what things could happen that would, uh, that would kind of push him to a place where some of that might start to crack, um, where some of his, his old, old sort of tendencies to make, make meaning out of disparate events would, would, you know, sort of get their, get its, get its tentacles into him and then where that might kind of break apart and, and what he might be left with afterward. Um, so, so no, I think that was, that was a really, um, it, I enjoyed that as an artist, even when I was kind of conflicted about it as an empathetic person. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Well, you know, we we all love uh, a redemption story, uh, a comeback story, and you know, when you're when you're first reading the book, um, this book could have gone in a very different direction, and it could have um, been a very different story with Mark, you know, completely redeeming himself and and coming back to society and 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 you know, reclaiming his throne, as it were, and uh, and and you chose to take us. Uh, on a very different character journey. Um, did in writing this, did your ideas of redemption story and the, kind of the, the underdog does good. Did, did those ideas uh, get challenged uh, in the writing of the story? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think it was really important to me that, you know, that I take seriously the things that he had done. If I was going to put all that backstory in, uh, I had to take that seriously. And people, people don't just, I mean, sometimes they radically change, usually through a kind of traumatic event of some kind, but for the most part, people don't, you know, go from, you know, full on asshole to Mr. Rogers um, over the course of a few days. And, um, and that was part of what I, I found really kind of interesting to explore with, with Mark is that, who he'd become as a sort of atheist security guard burnout was actually not too different from who he had been as a pastor. He had fewer people in his life, um, but he still was kind of moving through the world in the, in a similar way. And if anything, you know, he maybe just gets a little measure of, of humility by the end. Um, gets a little bit, a little measure of openness that he didn't have with the beginning. Um, I mean, you know, and that, and that felt kind of appropriate. I mean, another, Another book, you know, like I was thinking a lot about things like we talked about, like Augustine's Confessions or um, you know, some of Kierkegaard's books. But I was also thinking about um, things like uh, Thomas Pynchon's Crying of Lot 49, uh, where, you know, that the sort of drive to see everything as a conspiracy and how sometimes that, that conspiracy is actually more a figment of, the, of an imagination and, frankly, kind of a religious imagination. Um, and so I wanted to kind of... Uh, uh, see how someone like Mark would, would navigate that and, uh, and how that might, you know, sort of also crumble beneath his feet. Um, the book is told in, in first person where we're living through Mark as we read this. Um, did that ever become claustrophobic to you? Did you ever wish that you could step out to maybe a very close third person just to where it didn't feel so, so personal when you're writing it? Yeah, I tried um, as part of re revising, as I tell this to students too, um, I really recommend trying from trying writing scenes from different points of view. Sometimes when you're stuck on a scene, that can be really helpful to switch to third person, write it as a screenplay, uh, write from the secondary character's point of view. So I wrote some sections in a close third person, some in a distant third person. I actually wrote a lot from Cindy's point of view, who's the, the young woman that he meets by chance at the beginning of the book, and who he goes after is trying to find through, through much of the book. Um, and those were all really useful exercises. Um, but so much of, uh, of where my interests were and where I think the book was working best was in that first person and in how he would, how, not just how he would conduct himself across a series of events, but how he would think about them and how he would speak about them. Um, I think, you know, pastors, they kind of get their strength through their voice, you know, they're, they're storytellers. And so it felt like, you know, I need, this needs to be told from his point of view. Um, and that was, you know, why I ultimately decided not to, I had a whole sections I'd written from C's point of view that was also really helpful in understanding her character, but, it felt like no, like I don't, I don't have a right to kind of her story. It needs to be taking place off page, um, and and we're only seeing it where Mark is thinks thinks he understands what's going on, and maybe does or maybe doesn't. Um, and he's kind of constantly revising his story for what she's going through um, off screen. Gotcha, um, Patrick. Will, will we see more uh, stories from Mark Haynes? I don't know. Uh, you know, I've been thinking about it, um, but I don't know. I, right now, it feels like this this was kind of his story. 
Um, you know, there, there are great books where accidental detectives, uh, which Mark is one, I mean, he's not a, he's not a PI, he's not a cop, um, then go on to get caught up in further mysteries. Um, Elizabeth Hand's uh, Cass Neary books are amazing um, and have, a, you know, an accidental sort of detective at the center of them. Um, but, you know, as of right now, it's, it's hard for me to see what that next story will be, although I'm, I've definitely been thinking about it. Um, he's also, he's such a, he was such a difficult person to live with for the time it took to write the book. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm just a little afraid of spending more time in his head. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, well, I love the book. The Churchgoer is out available everywhere now. It's in paperback and audiobook and Kindle edition. Uh, Patrick, you've done a phenomenal job with this character, with this story, uh, and I absolutely love it. I'm sending everyone to pick up a copy of it. Um, if people are just learning about you, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Of course, and th thank you. I really do appreciate hearing that. It, it makes me feel so good. Um, and so, yeah, so if uh, if people are online, uh, I'm on Twitter um, at, uh, what am I, at Patrick M. Coleman. Um, my website is Um and, You know, I've got a Facebook page and things like that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, no, I, I really appreciate getting a chance to talk to you about this book and, um, and hearing your thoughts about it, too. It's just a delight. Great. We're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of The Churchgoer. Patrick, this has been so much fun talking. Uh, thank you for taking time to come on the show. Oh, thank you. I loved it. Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories podcast. Be sure to subscribe at hankgarner.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Hello, young one. What ghoulish tale of horror shall we explore tonight? Shall we watch The Creep Show? The Nightmare on Elm Street? Child of the Night, give me your answer. Which one would Mom kill us for watching? said Buddy. Dad grinned and his eyes grew wide. Which do you think, Child of the Jackal? The Omen! And we might have time for Omen, too, if we hurry. She'll be home by eleven. I'll be back. Buddy ran to his room. He stripped down to his Yoda underwear and fished in the closet. Two minutes later, he snuck back into the living room wearing his skeleton costume from last Halloween. He crept up behind his dad, who was cueing the movie. But David Rittermeyer was too clever for that. He spun around at the last moment and bared fang teeth torn from paper plates, drawing a yip of surprise and a cry of, No fair! Daddy kicked off his Reeboks, plopped his smelly gym socks on the coffee table, another thing that Mom would hate, and killed the lights. The scary intro music began. The screen showed the silhouette of a boy, about Buddy's age. His shadow was a long, creepy cross. The Antichrist, the son of the devil born of a jackal on a night of astrological portent, destined to bring about the end times and the final battle of good versus evil. Buddy sipped sun-kissed and scooted up next to his dad. As the movie got scarier, he slipped an arm through his father's and cupped his big bicep. Buddy could feel his father's pulse. Dads get scared, too. They flinched together, shouted together, pointed at the screen and covered their faces together. Buddy pressed his eyes to Daddy's shoulder just before the on-screen maid shouted, It's all for you, Damien! and dove from the roof, hanging herself. Buddy knew which parts he was old enough to watch and which parts he wasn't. He trusted his dad to let him know when to look again. Occasionally, his dad tricked him into peeking too soon, but that was part of the fun. They kicked their feet at the screen and shouted, Look up! Look up! Oh, idiot! Don't get yourself killed! At the climax, the hero of the movie, Mr. Thorne, discovered a birthmark of three sixes on his son's head and dragged the little antichrist to the altar of the church, determined to spear his son with holy daggers and end evil forever. After it was over, the Rittermeyer men sat silently through the credits. David put an arm around his son and ran his fingers through Buddy's hair. He wasn't searching for devil marks. He knew there weren't any and Buddy was certain there were no daggers in his father's hand, either. Those things were just make-believe. Real fathers and sons don't do bad things to each other. They were queuing up Omen 2, 
when the power went out. No, Buddy whined. Not on movie night. Daddy went to the window. It's the whole block. Sorry, Damien. How about... Hmm. Scary blackout. Go get the Ouija board out of the guest room closet. Cool. And candles. Buddy found the Ouija board, hidden under old clothes. When he shut the sliding door again, the sight of a monster startled him, and he let out an involuntary, huh, sound. It was his own skeleton-bodied reflection in the mirrored closet door. He stared at it. He liked the effect of moonlight on his cheeks. Spectral, haunted, his eyes big and white. He clacked his teeth at himself, picturing his own grinning skull under his child's flesh, and gave an evil laugh. He was answered by a scream. A woman's scream. High-pitched and far away. One of the neighbors? Buddy dropped the Ouija board into a patch of moonlight and sat with it. What's going on? He whispered, his fingers on the heart-shaped wood planchette. 